Your honor. Do you remember these? No. <laughs> That's 
I'm going to be bringing around the signing sheet, so you want to come up, please. somebody, educate all of you uh, through, the, through the mouths of each one of these candidates uh, who are seeking the office of Dayton City Commission. One week from today, there is a primary. And as you see, there is a field of six candidates. Uh, and that on next Tuesday, one week from today, will be go down to actually four candidates uh, on Tuesday evening after all the ballots have been counted. Uh, then from Tuesday until the general election, Four names will uh, proceed on to the general election. And then once the general election uh, is over, we'll come out with our two new city commissioners. So we want to make certain that, uh, that everybody had an opportunity to listen to all of the candidates uh, today and to get a good feel for who you're going to be voting for next Tuesday in the primary election. Uh, so, and have we have people seated? is I want to welcome Marcus Bettinger down the end. And they're, in, and they're seated by their name in alphabetical order. Marcus Bettinger, Valerie Duncan, uh, David Ezrati, Matt Joseph, Chris Shaw, and Jordan Worthen. So each one of these individuals are vying for uh, the office of Dayton City Commission. We have two incumbents, uh, which is Matt Joseph and Christopher Shaw, and there are four other uh, candidates that are seeking uh, to for those particular offices. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to uh, our mm -hmm. political acting chair, Tom Roberts, so he can give some ground rules, and then we're gonna get into the question and answers. We're gonna have questions that's coming from, well, uh, we're gonna have questions coming from the Dayton Union NHP members, and also, I have some questions coming from community members uh, that are associated with our round table. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to welcome all of you to our annual candidates forum. This is the forum for the candidates for the Dayton City Commission. Two ladies up front, candidates have each question will be asked. You have two minutes. Two minutes to ask the question. The yellow, answer the question. The yellow card means you have 30 seconds. The red means stop. <laughs> we will stop you. Okay, we will stop you because we want to make this flow. And so don't force me to do something that you don't want me to do. Just respect each other and know you have two minutes. So I'll marshal your time. There will be several people uh, who will be passing around questions. We will ask the questions. The president and I will ask the questions. So you have a question? put them on a piece of paper, and we will ask the question. We may not ask the question specifically that you ask, because we're gonna put them together. If there are several questions asking similar questions, we'll ask one big question as opposed to three different questions. So uh, don't come up afterwards and say, well, you didn't ask my question. Tell you up front, I'm gonna ask the question. We're gonna ask the questions. You're gonna assist us, as President Forward said. You're going to give us some questions. 
We've asked our membership to give us questions, and we've gotten a bunch of questions from our members throughout the last two days. And so between President Forward and myself, we will be asking the questions. Ready to stop. We will have a two-minute timer. 30 seconds, two-minute timer. Any questions about the rules? And we will try to stay in order. You know, and we may mix it up, you know, so you don't, we'll mix it up. I'm sure we'll mix it up. I guarantee you that, because I like doing that. Anybody here? We're cool? Um, people who are passing out questions can just kind of raise your hands. Terrence Williams is one. So if you have a question, there's a piece of paper, pass it to one of these individuals. Okay, Mr. President, I'm ready. Uh, so, we are going, going to, at this time, uh, have our second vice president, Colonel Vacuum Chair, to ask the first question. Well, I'm going to ask each candidate to give us a two-minute introduction of yourselves. Who are you? Why would you want to be on the Dayton City Commission? You have two minutes. Who are you? And we'll start at the end. Are we standing? It's up to you. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for the invitation tonight. I am Marcus Bettinger. Um, I'm born and raised in Dayton. I lived in Tribewood, specifically grew up in Townview, um, which I say is as close as you can get to Dayton physically in Tribewood as possible. Um, the West Side was my stuffing grounds growing up. I went to the Revival Center. Um, I was in the Dayton Boys Choir. Um, and when I was a child, I saw a lot of problems in our community. The, you know, the alleyways were dark. The, there were abandoned homes back then. There are even more now. Um, the trash, the, gla the broken glass, all of these problems existed back then. Um, I'm 34 years old now, so here we are 20 years later, um, and when I walk out of my door in Roosevelt, I live in the Roosevelt neighborhood, <coughs> excuse me, I see the same things. Um, the house next door is abandoned, the city cuts the grass, the trees are overgrowing the power lines, and it's been like that for the three years that I've lived there. I moved home from New York during the pandemic to be closer to my family, because um, it got really tough, but um, that has persisted since I moved there. The trees scared the living daylights out of my other neighbor, a nice gentleman, Mr. Allen, who would give you the shirt off his back, um, but that house scares him. And uh, down the street earlier this week, a house burned to the ground at Woodward and Second Street. I woke up smelling smoke in my house. Um, that's what people are dealing with in Dayton. It's multiplied thousands of times over across all of our community. Um, and we need to answer the tough questions. We have people here who are running for potentially their 24th year in office. What have you done in a, a neighborhood like Roosevelt? Um, we have to ask the tough questions because the answers are tough. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Valerie Duncan, and I'm running for the Dayton City Commission. Uh, I represent, I want to represent the people. I want to represent the, the, um, the homeowners. I want to represent the homeless. I want to represent the abused women. I want to represent all the people that the city has forgotten about. I want to establish a home ownership for all the residents of the city of Dayton. And I want to do that by a comprehensive plan that will give people a, a, an opportunity to uh, own a home if they want to, to fix their home if they want to, to restore homes if they want to. What, and the homeless and the abused women, all of these people that have fallen by the wayside, we need to address our, um, our dilemma. There's so many gaps in our social programs and these people are falling into cracks. And what's going to, and what's being affected is our neighborhoods. Our neighborhoods are being affected because the homeless people are living in these empty houses, right? They're living in these empty houses. They get cold at night, they start a fire. That's what happened to that mansion. And then it all goes up in smoke, that one uh, large, mansion was going to be coming up for auction. Look what happened to the Wright Brothers um, manufacturing uh, establishment that, that went up in smoke too. And this is the reason. And then are you going to live, are people are living next to these, these structures and it's becoming unsafe. So I want to do that plus get the chemicals out of our water supply and help youth with their education and their uh, uh, their development, and I hope I have all of your votes. I'm the only woman on, on the, uh, that is a, a candidate, and I hope I, I get your
your support. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Ezrati. I've been doing this for 30 years. And you say, why is he still doing this for 30 years? Some people don't quit. You know, I can tell you one thing. If you put a filter on what's happened in Dayton in the last 30 years, and you want it all to make sense, it's really simple. The people who run this city in the back room don't work for you. The Montgomery County Democratic Party, who tells you who to vote for, they work for the demolition contractors. And once you figure that out, they work for the demolition contractors and the developers, everything makes sense. I don't mean, you know, I brought literature from 30 years ago, and I can start reading this, and you'll say the same problems exist today. I can bring literature from 12 years ago. The same problems exist today. If you vote for these two incumbents, the same problems will exist four years from now, two years from now. It won't change. There are two people on this commission that have been trying to stop the, rec the backroom deals, Shanice Turner Sloss and Daryl Fairchild, it takes three votes to fix anything. If you remove one of those two, things will change. If you re-elect them, the demolition contractors win, the developers win, and we lose. Now, I'm not going to tell you a story about my neighborhood being bad, because my neighborhood in the last 30 years has done great. Because I understand how the development works, how working with the people to develop social capital works how making a neighborhood that people want to live in makes more people want to come and live there. That's what we need to do to the whole city. I can drive through the west side and I see no progress. I can drive through downtown and while they say there's progress, it's not the same. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Joseph. Thank you. Uh, I'm Matt Joseph, I'm city commissioner. Uh, I'm a logistician for my day job, and I uh, work with data. I've been fishing for a while now, I've been using for a couple of times. Uh, I really appreciate the fact that citizens have, have elected me a couple of times to be a commissioner. I love the work. Uh, I do it because I love the city and I love our residents. Because I wanna, I wanna make sure that the city is something that I turn over to my kids and my grandkids in better shape than, than I sure was when, when I started. Forums like this are great. I appreciate it. Dr. Ford, Senator Robert, appreciate your putting this together. Everybody who helped set it up, especially since the, the primary election is coming up so quickly, it's really important that you all have a chance to hear from all of us, and maybe just as important that we have a chance to hear from you. Uh, with the election so close, I know it wasn't easy to do this, and I really appreciate y'all doing that. Um, it has been a tough few years. There is no way around it. Uh, from the housing crisis, foreclosure crisis 20 years ago, to the Great Recession, to the tornadoes and everything that happened in the last few years, followed by the pandemic. Um, it, it has not been easy, but we have done okay, and there is a great possibility of doing much better now. You can see that uh, over the last decade, we've knocked down thousands of old houses that can no be used again. Uh, as as I've walked through neighborhoods and knocked on doors over these last few weeks, I can see the difference from, from years before. You can see the difference, neighborhoods coming back. Uh, there were thousands of new jobs created, people are working again, and we've made strides, maybe most importantly, on making our city a city where everyone can thrive. No matter what you look like, where you come from, what language you speak, who you love, uh, it doesn't matter. We want to be a welcoming city, and we want to make sure everybody is empowered and has resources and, and things they need. I'm, uh, I'm Chris Shaw, State City Commissioner. I am, uh, first of all, I want to thank the end of the NAACP for this forum tonight. Uh, thanks, thanks to all of the members that are here today. Uh, I am one of you, a life member of this organization, and I spent a lot of time uh, volunteering uh, uh, with this organization for, to be a former chair of the Economic Development Department. I am a small business owner in this community. My, my family has owned the business just up the street, a couple blocks up the street, for 113 years. I, I understand what it takes to make business grow in a community 
and I'm really uh, concerned about making connectivity with the workforce, that we are bringing our young people into the workforce through apprenticeship programs, which I uh, help the AF AFL-CIO and the Building Trades Union go to Washington, D.C. and bring back hundreds of thousands of dollars to stand up these programs, because we know how important it is, and it's starting to pay dividends. You know, these are good paying jobs, 50, 80, $100,000 jobs, and it's about making these connections. David Andrade is right. I'm not in the pocket of developers, but we are encouraging development in the city because that's how you grow the neighborhoods. The work that we do in downtown Dayton funds up to 70% of the development in this neighborhood and your neighborhood. So we've got to continue that. Making very good strides, and we're gonna, if elected again, I'm gonna to continue to do that work. Bringing transportation money back here, bringing HUD money, CDBG money, traveling to Washington, D.C. and lobbying for just that, just returned last week from doing that same thing. So I want to continue to do that work, and I'm going to ask you for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. I just want to thank you guys for coming here. I just want to uh, show my appreciation for Mr. Ford and NAACP and the members are here. It's wonderful to see. We have citizens who are engaged, willing to drive here to see our seven candidates and see what the platforms are. So I'm Jordan Workman, and I'm running for Dayton City Commissioner. I'm born and raised in West Dayton. I went to Shawnee Julian High School. I graduated in 2007, and immediately I went to the University of Cincinnati. I studied communications, <coughs> criminal justice, and business. I graduated from the University of Cincinnati in 2011. Immediately I came back and took the uh, Dayton police test. Now why I took the Dayton police test? I was a daddy's boy. My dad was a police officer. So this is near and dear to my heart. This isn't a job, this is my passion. This is what I live for. I'm the son of a fighter. My mom's a fighter. My dad's a fighter for principle, for community, for transparency, and for accountability. My dad <clears throat> participated in Black Fraternal Order of the Police. This is something I, I know some of you may know very well, and some of you may not. Um, historically, civil rights was a big struggle in the city of Dayton. There was a lot of people who died going across the river and fighting for civil rights. We've made progress, but I think we have a lot more progress to make. That was initially what I wanted to be. I wanted to resemble my dad. My dad had a rapport with the citizens. He was a homicide detective. My dad was one of the few. He was a cop that you knew his name, his first and last name. You could call him and you know he would come and treat you with respect. Now, I wanted to be like that. Going into the Dayton Police Department was a fantastic, fantastic experience, eye-opening experience. I think there's a lot of progress we should make within our city services. There's transparency issues. There's accountability issues that I think y'all are aware of, and that's why you're here, because you think that we do need change for the better. And the three things that I think we're all gonna talk about is gonna be the neighborhood advancement, the blight, the issues in our neighborhood, uh, transparency and accountability, investment in our youth, um, job, high paying jobs. And last, we want more participation. We want more civic-led engagement, <coughs> engagement between our commissioners. Certain commissioners are going out to the community, certain ones aren't, and I think you know who they are. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. So as you've heard, the opening remarks from our six candidates, whose names will appear on the ballot next week, one week from today. You've had an opportunity to hear opening speeches, and now we're gonna get into the Q&A session. But what I wanna say uh, is thank all of you for coming out, and thank you for being respectful of each person to give them their time and their space to state who they are. The first question, the, the goal of the city of Dayton is to provide service amenities in open government, yet uh, expect, uh, expect a first class city, a hub of thriving region. So my question to you as a candidate for city commission and city, commi uh, city commissioners, what services do you think we're providing well what amenities and open government? And we'll start at the end and work our way down again. Two minutes. Two minutes. So I think um, right now you can go to the city of Dayton and you can actually get a lot of great services and I, that's really important. What we need is more of that. We need city commissioners who are present in our neighborhoods. Now I had experience working for the federal Congress, for a member of Congress when I lived in New York. 
and I worked in nonpartisan constituent services. So what that meant is when constituents in the area had trouble with federal agencies, they came to our office and we connected them to those resources. We need a lot more of that in, in Dayton. Just as I've been running, people come, come to me, message me on social media and say, hey, how can I register my business as a minority-based enterprise? How can I register my business as woman-owned? We, you shouldn't have to come to a candidate for office for that. You should be able to go to your city um, and, and get a response. And they, they said to me that they've reached out to a number of people, they get nothing back. Um, and so there's a disconnect between what the city offers and actually making it accessible to the city. Commissioner Shaw mentioned the jobs, the high paying jobs. We need high paying jobs, but if the people who live here in Dayton aren't connected to them, then who are you creating jobs for? Um, so just across the board, there's a disconnect between what we say is happening and what people are able to access. And so if you need two and three degrees for a job, or if you don't have transportation to access a job, you're not really creating work. Um, you know, you're, you're creating talking points. Um, and the same goes with our city services. We have to make sure people can access what we say we provide. Um, and that's my perspective on the issue. Back when I first bought my house in 1986, and what got me started in the political sphere, I bought a house for $14,500 in South Park. No signs anywhere saying it was a historic district. First thing I'm doing is trying to fix it up. I put new garage doors up. The city takes me to court because the garage doors were wood grain vinyl instead of wood or vinyl not imitating wood. And this is when there was a steel and plastic dumpster right there. So I go down to City Hall and I plead my case and it's like talking to a wall. No response. I was the bad guy. I had to take that door down, those doors down, and put up inferior doors that had to be replaced. That was their idea of making things work penalizing people for fixing up their houses, and they still do it. And the people who don't do it, you end up paying for their mistakes. And we cannot demolish our way to prosperity. I would rather spend the money that they're spending with Steve Roush and blade cutters on fixing houses that people live in so that they are 
gonna be able to stay there and survive. I would rather have open, honest government that's transparent, that doesn't give $178,000 to a guy who wants to beat up five Dayton police officers while ignoring my friend John Lumpkin, who's an Ohio State football star and a former banker and a great guy. He hasn't got a dime for his building in Wright Dunbar. Can you explain how these things happen? I sure can. I know lots of small businesses that have started in this city without any help from the, the city because that's what I do in my business. Thank you. So the question was, uh, what services in the city does the, uh, services and amenities does the city provide well? Um, I'll mention two that, uh, that are near and dear to my heart. The first is recycling. When I started, there wasn't any such thing as recycling bins in the city. Uh, over the time I've been here, we've expanded it, and now every couple of weeks, I can get the recycling picked up. It's not only the right thing to do because uh, it means less trash going into the uh, into the dump. Uh, it's also better a lot of the times. It's cheaper to do it that way too. The second thing I would talk about is the way that we fought to bring back curbside leaf pickup. A lot of folks that live in neighborhoods with big trees for a few years had to bag the leaves. Uh, it's a lot of work, especially since there are a lot of seniors in these neighborhoods. So we were able to figure out a way at much less cost to bring back curbside uh, leaf pickup. And the last one I want to talk about is a recent one, uh, something we do well. Uh, over the last year, almost a year now, we've had a unit called the Mediation Response Unit, which uh, instead of uh, when people call for help for a situation that uh, would be better handled by somebody who's unarmed, somebody who's not a policeman, a police officer, uh, we send a mediation person, a mediation response unit to that. Uh, and it's been wildly successful, so much so that our officers are asking for them to respond to more. Um, so I'm really proud of that service. I think that uh, it helps keep the tension down, lowers the heat in some of those interactions, and provides better service for our citizens. Thank you. Well, you stole a lot of my thunder. <laughs> Oops, that was sorry. Uh, so, transparency in terms of services and amenities in the city. We do a survey every year to ask you how you feel about your city government and the work that we're doing in the community across all the departments. Um, public works is always very high uh, on the list, and uh, you know we rely on getting your feedback in terms of how we plan for how we're going to budget um, for, the, for the coming year. Uh, issue nine, thanks to you, we are able to uh, get funding to repave all of the all of the roads, the, the side roads, and that work is starting to happen. Uh, it's, it's been happening. Coming to the end of it. very successful program. Uh, the parks, parks and rec. Now we've had some issues there. <coughs> it was not good to us in that in that way. Um, we are trying to strengthen our our pools, our aquatics program. Uh, but we need more lifeguards. So the work that I have been doing is again trying to connect young people and others with these high-paying, in-demand jobs in order to help us provide the services, to keep the Rec and Park facilities open um, and provide those services to our youth. Um, we can't do that without your help, without uh, you know, kids getting into the lifeguard program so that we can staff these, these operations, but we're doing that work. So there's, there are a lot of good things happening. I'm very proud of the work that our, our um, city staff has been doing under very difficult situations, and this is across the board. You know, we didn't get into the situation that we're in now overnight. It took about 40 years, and we won't get out of it overnight. But we're making strides every day trying to work to make this city better. And uh, we're going to keep doing that. And if you elect me, uh, we are going to continue this work and make it even more robust uh, and, and uh, strengthen our communities and the services and amenities that you want. But we're going to continue to ask for that. Mr. Worth. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Roberts, for that question. That was a great question. <coughs> I'll be blunt. There's not many things that go great. Um, for example, our city commission meeting. I'm honored that commissioners come once a week, every Wednesday, and allow you to talk to them for three minutes. But I'm really not a, a public speaker. I don't think a lot of you are a public speaker. To go to a commission meeting and to have everybody stare at you for three minutes to talk, then it's a bomb. 
I think that's somewhat good, but I think we need way more dialogue. Certain commissioners are going out to community, doing town halls, Q&A, questions and answers. What does that create? Dialogue. If I'm elected commission, you ask me a question, I have to give you a response. Either I know the answer or I don't know the answer. It creates trust accountability. But the current setup now is you go to the microphone, you talk for three minutes, and then you're threatened to place under arrest if you talk a second afterwards. Um, <clears throat> my dad and my mother is big into the civil rights and in terms of holding the, uh, the government accountable. There's one thing I do like. The day you deliver that, if I was a police officer and you would call and you had a problem, for example, trash, uh, a hole in the ground, I would fix it. I would, I would fix it myself. I'd call dispatch and say, hey, at 126 West Norman, we got such and such problem. This was 10, 15 years ago. So our dispatch would, would, would uh, parlay back to, a, to an unknown city function. There was no, uh, you didn't get a, a, a case number. You couldn't go online. You couldn't go through your phone and get problems solved. So they delivered that. I think it's a pretty, pretty good idea. I think it could be enhanced in terms of where, you, where are you in alignment. And Mr. Parks, Mr. John Parks, who's head of waste collection and recycle, I think our waste collection is great. I love Mr. Parks. He's very responsive. If you have an issue with your trash can being stolen, call Mr. Parks. If you don't have his number, I'll give it to you tonight after this meeting. He'll come and replace your trash can. Um, if you're saying stop. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, we're here to critique things, not to talk about how great things are going. We're all here born and raised in Dayton. Our minority business development has pretty much been decimated. Uh, one candidate uh, talked about a housing inspector. That's when I was a police officer, was 40, 50, now it's a few. So on one hand, um, the emergency orders that we see certain commissioners just abuse, they're doing it left and right, sneaking through things that you don't know of, and things are just being snuck through. It's black and transparency. Uh, Human Relations Council, that's pretty much just been decimated. Thank you. Uh, we're going to mix it up a bit. We're going to start with uh, Mr. Joseph and go that way and begin up here. And those that are listening uh, are saying they cannot hear some of you. So I'm just going to ask you to <coughs> talk to the people at the wall so they can hear. So go ahead, Mr. Dr. Farrell, with your next question. Okay, uh, this question here is coming from one of our community partners. And it says, uh, and this is more specifically going to the incumbents, but I would like to hear from uh, the other candidates as well, uh, but just in a different format. Are, are there any plans to bring more businesses to West Dayton? For example, Sugar Creek, which employs people in the neighborhood. So uh, that question uh, should go first to the two sitting uh, commissioners, and then uh, what would the other candidates do if you were in their chair uh, at the same time? Thank you, Dr. Ford. Uh, question is, businesses, new businesses and new jobs to West State. Um, something that I learned as a city commissioner is that the best way to create more jobs is to support the businesses that are already there. Uh, the questioner mentioned Sugar Creek, which is a great employer and a great neighbor. Uh, we do everything we can to make sure that they're expanding there, to make sure that uh, they're hiring our folks, to make sure that we're, we're doing everything we can to cooperate. And they're not the only example, they're a great example. So trying to make sure that we're taking care of the employers who are here and to keep hiring is, is, is very important to us. Uh, as far as attracting new, uh, this is Commissioner Shaw's thing, so I'm gonna let him talk mostly about it. But I will say that we're excited about some of the entrepreneurship opportunities we have with our Entrepreneur Center. Uh, we're reaching out west. Uh, we have folks reaching out to people with ideas, uh, helping them develop them into business plans. We have these efforts funded, and through our new office at the Arcade, the Entrepreneur Center, uh, we're going to make sure that they have the network and the resources that they need to, to bring this to fruition. But I don't want to steal Commissioner Shaw's thunder again. I'll <laughs> let him, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, that is very near and dear to my heart, uh, attracting businesses to our community, to supporting the ones that are already here. We have a very robust uh, process for that, and the procurement enhancement plan. Uh, I was one who helped create that many, many years before I ever thought about running for office because I drew on my experiences in the business community. And uh, we put together a good program. Is it, is it perfect? No. Uh, when we first started that, it had a lot of teeth in it. We had some compliance that was very robust. We had uh, joint ventures that we used to 
strengthen and, and help small businesses that are just out on their own to get funding and to get um, bonding, which is really important. But we're starting to see businesses grow in West Dayton. The West Dayton Incubator, and the commissioner was just talking about the arcade downtown and the Entrepreneur Center, making connectivity into the neighborhoods, and that was intentional. We made it very clear that that's what we wanted. So I talked to you about traveling to DC to bring back resources here. What did that? I'm on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee for the National League of Cities, and I was able to bring back $200,000 to stand up the RAISE program, which connects the ecosystem downtown and, and uh, the entrepreneur ecosystem with West Dayton specifically, not East Dayton, West Dayton, because we know that that is a very neglected part of our city, but with very rich resources and folks that understand business, they just need to be supported a little bit. So we're getting, we're getting to that. Um, these connections are happening live. Uh, so many different resources that are in the community for small business. But we're gonna continue to support that, and uh, if you let me, uh, in, in November, we are gonna strengthen that and make it even better uh, than it has been. And, and for, the, uh, for the candidates, the other candidates, uh, if you were in that chair, uh, you know, what would you do specifically to bring new business to West Dayton? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Ford, for that question. Um, I didn't tell you the other side of myself. I'm a minority uh, business owner. I've been investing in businesses for 13 years. I'm in a very unique position. I work for myself, I work how I want to work, and I work when I want to work. So I'm in a very unique position. I have the time to be here to talk to you and serve the citizens. Three things I think businesses care about. Taxes, regulations, profitability. So if we go out to different communities, the first thing I'm gonna ask is, is it conducive for my business? What's your taxes? What's your local income taxes? What regulatory costs is that you have? Are they up to date? Excuse me, sir. Are they out of date? <laughs> and profitability. If you're a business person, I'm in business. You gotta make money. If you're not making money, you can't pay your employees. You can't pay the over overhead. You can't pay your mortgage. So, with that being said, if I was elected city commissioner, going out to businesses and talking to them and learning and just listening, saying, hey, what do you think we could do better? Um, I'm self employed. I don't have an actual business of employees. So I would love to talk to business owners, and I talk to them, I have relationships with business owners to, to this day. What, what can the city do to help be more conducive to your business? Are there any taxes or any type of ordinances that are outdated, or are there ordinances that we need that can help your business thrive? Um, secondly, youth. As a city commissioner, if I'm elected, investing in youth, that is business. I'm 34, but I'm looking at a kid who's maybe 14, that's the next Jordan Warden, the next day trader, investor, real estate person. So investing in youth is investing in business because eventually we're gonna give the torch to them. And if you have a business now, like I have a business now, I want my son to take it, my son's five. When I'm dead and gone, I want my son to operate my business. So investing in youth is huge. And I appreciate that question, Mr. Ford, and I think that that's how I approach it from the Bay City Commission. Mr. Um, oh no, I'm sorry, Mr. Banger. Um, I think what we keep hearing tonight is this idea that uh, development and job creation has to start downtown. Um, and part of what my campaign is saying is we need to change the conversation and be far more intentional about the west side of Dayton. Um, and so what that meant for me is saying um, the tax abatements and the, the tools that we use to usher in development downtown, we can do the same thing on the west side if we prioritize it. Uh, my campaign is actually supported by someone who grew up in the area. Her father was an engineer um, in the Oregon district. Uh, her name is Hannah Beekman. Um, she is an award-winning uh, movie filmmaker. She got an Oscar for the movie Black Panther. She's looking at returning to Dayton and investing millions in this community by being visionary, not by saying, let's keep rolling out the red carpet for big businesses that cut and run as, as soon as things get hard in this community. I grew up in Troutville. There's a mall missing, there's a Walmart missing, there's a Target missing, there are grocery stores missing. That is replicated in Dayton. We can't keep rolling out the red carpet for big developers who have no investment in this community aside from what we give them from the candy store. And then as soon as things get hard, they run. So what I'm saying is let's be visionary and let's be thoughtful and let's be intentional. So Hannah Beekler, you know, someone who has millions to invest in this community is saying, let's build film industry on the west side. We have entire industries 
to replace. My dad was a factory worker. He now drives trucks five days a week. He, that's not what he planned to do for the rest of his life. You know, and, and his job was pulled from up underneath his feet. And we have entire you know, manufacturing industry to replace. We have to be far more visionary than you know, piecemealing it with this business and that business. We have to invite entire industry here. And Hannah Bickler is bringing millions to the west side of Dayton, buying a home on Siebenthaler and saying, let's be visionary about our community. Um, and that's my perspective. my business, for what I do, and a business I started in an old corner grocery store that was I bought for $2,200 that should have been torn down, is I own an ad agency. So we work with small startups, medium, small, medium-sized businesses, and we help them grow. They pay us for the services. This is what I do. I help businesses grow. And I'm going to tell you something. Politicians who think their job is job creation are smoking something. That is not their job. It is not their job to be investors, to be picking winners and losers. Why did we give $2 million for a hotel in the arcade? We just built three other hotels downtown. There is no need for your tax dollars to go to subsidize a corporation from out of town to open a hotel. You talk about job creation on the west side, yet where did the job creation go under these guys? You been out the airport lately? Do you see all that, those new warehouses, right? Where are the people going, how are they getting there to those jobs? There's no easy bus route, there's no train. Now the roads are clogged up there with cars and trucks going up to the airport, which wasn't meant for that, while we've got the old McCall publishing site sitting there empty with a rail spur and everything else. They don't really care about jobs on the west side that you can get to. If you want to see people rise out of poverty, I talked about some of these things 30 years ago. <coughs> One is we need round-the-clock affordable child care because that's the leading problem of people getting to jobs and getting to work, young people, and get them out of poverty. There are cities that have gone, done free public transit, and I want Dayton to be one of them to help bring people out of poverty and get them to those jobs. Thank you. I'm gonna to try to combine several questions because they go to 
um, the division on the city commission. And one question asks this question, what steps are you taking uh, now to set up a compromise city budget to avoid the unrest we had at the end of uh, last year's cycle? And the other one is uh, I was perplexed to to a recent resolution to pay a mediator to work out the differences between the commissioners. Isn't it the prerogative for the commissioners to vote the way they believe their constituents desire? And so I think if I combine those two, I'm asking the candidates and the current commissioners, uh, how would you avoid the, uh, the stalemate we had in December? And how would we go forward with, uh, without asking for an outside, I don't know how much was paid for this consultant, but how do we go forward as a unified commission without paying more taxpayers' dollars for an outside consultant to do something that we, that you as elected officials should be doing, as elected officials should be able to do. Now let's start with Mr. Shaw and go this way now and come back, okay? Thank you. Okay, great, thanks for that, uh, for that question. Yeah, frankly, I, I don't believe we have to uh, agree on everything. I mean, I think we've all been elected to uh, vote the way that we feel is right, uh, and that's what I intend, uh, intend to continue doing. Uh, yeah, there, there has been a lot of uh, angst and anxiety and just issues uh, uh, upon the days, and it was different than anything I've ever, ever experienced uh, prior to now. But the fact of the matter is we all uh, care about this city. We want to make things better. Um, hard choices that we have to make. Uh, money doesn't grow on a tree out in front of City Hall, so we have to make very difficult choices. But uh, at the end of the day, I think we're on a good path here. Um, and I don't think that there is a huge uh, problem if we disagree sometimes. Oftentimes, it's the way that we do it. Because these uh, commission meetings are not town hall meetings. They are business meetings, um, and regular order would suggest that we conduct them uh, in that way. But uh, no, things um, are moving well. We are going to be just fine on this next budget cycle. I think it is important that we kind of scale back on these emergency resolutions. I think it's important that we uh, proceed effectively, and we're doing that work. So I will continue to vote my conscience, and I would encourage all my colleagues to do the same thing. Uh, and, and things will, will start to, to uh, calm down and get a lot better. But uh, these are all very passionate people. Uh, we agree on about 95% of the things, but again, it's just how do you do it? Uh, and we will work through that. Okay, Mr. Worthen's next, then we start to begin. Okay. Um, Mr. Roberts, thank you for putting that about that. <clears throat> I think that we all here are educated, we have common sense. If I'm a police officer and I go to a scene, I see an anomaly, if I see something that doesn't make sense, it makes you look further into something. Mm -hmm. Two commissioners and the mayor in the past several years have agreed on everything. Mm -hmm. I know you know mm -hmm. three people with different experiences, backgrounds, religions. It's impossible for three people to agree on everything. So what does that lead you to believe? So there's something behind the story I think any normal person would look into. So saying that, emergency orders are totally abused. Why are they abused? Again, it's investigated, it's a red flag. Why are they abused? I'm asking a rhetorical question, I think I can answer that rhetorical question. If I wait till the last minute, put something through, that lacks transparency. That lacks accountability. I don't think this is just Jordan's opinion. I think, you know, I've I owned a business for some years. I've raised a son. It's just common sense. My mom and father were pretty smart people. So emergency orders are very abused. The $30,000 that we just spent, because you have certain commissioners that want to protect the establishment, and certain commissioners that don't care about the establishment, it's a waste of money. And what are you going to accomplish? Nothing. Until we have a collaborative effort of all commissioners. 
being genuine and voting on their heart. What makes the United States of America is freedom. You have to freely believe what you believe. And that's what makes us unique and one of the best countries in this world. Mr. Bennett, here. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, when you're asking, should we be paying, <coughs> excuse me, tax, tax dollars to get adults to get along, I think the answer is an unequivocal no. Um, when we need to pay, you know, to the tune of thirty or forty thousand dollars to foster basic working relationships with people who have been duly elected, <clears throat> I think it speaks to the people who have the power on the day. And when you have your three votes, to your point, there's no need to agree on everything because you have the agreement that you need. Um, and that's what we saw in the budget fight. They had the agreement, you know, and it was it was a foregone conclusion. So to talk to the other commissioners was busy work. Um, we can't have that when they have been duly elected and very vigorous election. Um, and so we need to get to a place where we are having conversations on every issue, not just because you have a monopoly on power or like a recent vote, you recused yourself. Um, and then when things got a little dicey, you were going to come out of recusement uh, to make sure you know you got what you wanted out of the commission. That's not fair. That's not transparent. That's not where we need to be. And it doesn't do a service to this community. Um, furthermore, in a country where we see rampant violence and gun violence and abuse, the idea that we can turn on our committee mission, a city commission meeting and see a duly elected member of the commission being screamed at, um, shut down, silenced in the face of police chiefs or whoever else wants to speak um, to what the, the three um, you know, with the voting power uh, want to hear or want to pass, um, that trickles down to the neighborhood. And so, you, you know, I have a sister, I have a mother, my sons are young. I don't want them learning that it's okay in the halls of power to scream at a woman you don't agree with. And I think we are way beyond the pale when it comes to basic respect on our city commission. time in my neighborhood that we were deeply divided. We had people paying for memberships in my neighborhood organization to, to have them come and vote. Five dollars was the membership fee back then. And we had something like 200 votes this election. And it was a division. And things went really bad. And so 
I ran for neighborhood president, and what I did was institute policies and an agenda with time limits and make sure people got heard, make sure everything was clear, and these meetings stopped being three hours long, and we came together, and after two years, I said, okay, I've got this guy picked to be my replacement, he's gonna take over, and things smoothed out. I also ran a veterans business group for seven years, and we did a lot of things, and there was a lot of division there, and we brought everybody together, and it worked well. But, let's talk about the real elephant in the living room right here. Shelley Dickstein should have been fired on the spot for bringing a budget as an emergency ordinance. Shelley Dickstein should still be held liable for the hole on Ludlow, that big gaping spot where she paid all this money to student suites to come here, your tax dollars, $2 million, made a hole in the ground, gave the, the, the crown piece of the building to the, the, the guy who tore everything down, including the party he wasn't supposed to, Shelly Dickstein, who spent $5 million to bring a Kroger without a contract. Why is this woman still running? And I'll tell you why. Because power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. These three men, and I have a lot of respect for Mr. Mims, for Mayor Mims. I don't have a whole lot of respect for these two guys. I think they're really nice guys, but I don't think they have a clue. We had a culture of corruption investigation by the FBI. It's not done. And you will find out Thank eventually you Thank you. what really happened. Um, just so you know. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, you yeah. Mr. Joseph. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, Senator. Uh, so, uh, my old colleague, uh, Mayor McClinton, used to say the key to, to commission doing business the right way was to disagree without being disagreeable. And uh, those are words that have stuck with me the whole time, just like a lot of other things she said. But this one particularly, is, it's in my head, you know. Um, so Commissioner Fairchild asked us to do mediation. You know, I, I can't say mediation is my favorite thing in the world. I can't imagine not many, many people do think it's great. But I, I think we were willing to try it. If you wanted to try it, we said, okay. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying. Um, but really the key is to make sure that we disagree and we find good ways to disagree. Part of that is... Uh, making sure the process uh, leading up to legislation, notification of what's going on, make sure that's access accessible to everybody, make sure it's agreeable to everybody, that everybody's comfortable with when they know about a piece of legislation or proposed legislation, uh, you know, when they know the schedule for budget hearings, uh, how many there are, that sort of thing. So if you have a good process leading up, something that everybody, all five of us agree on ahead of time, that smooths things out on the back end, it really does. So I, I, I have good hope, like Commissioner Shaw said, that we're on the way to getting things uh, running more smoothly, uh, living up to, to Mayor McLean's, uh suggestion that we need to learn how to disagree about being disagreeable. And uh, like Commissioner said, we all want the best for the city. We do. We have slightly different ways of looking at it, um, but, but I think we're making strides, and, and I certainly am going to work to get there. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, there is a question from one of our members that uh, specifically for Mr. Esrati, but we're not going to do that because <laughs> we want to make certain that the questions that we ask here, everybody has an opportunity uh, to answer those particular questions. So we're not singling out anyone. Uh, so I, that's, and that's to our members. We're not going to do that. So it, it just for the President, if I may. So if you gave me a question for a specific candidate, that question will not be asked either. So what the president say, if there is a specific question for a specific individual, we will not ask it. Right. If you can make it generic to everybody, then we'll put it into the mix, okay? Go ahead, Mr. President. Okay, all right. Um, so the next question uh, that I have is, uh, is from one of our members, another one from one of our members. Uh, and then my next question after uh, Chairman Roberts is that I'm gonna go to education from there. But this question specifically says, what is the general plan for permanent part-time city employees to become full-time? What is the general plan for permanent part-time city employees to become full-time? And maybe if you all can well, I guess we're going to start with Jordan now and go, go around. Thank you for that question, whoever asked it. Um, what is the plan to make 
part-time employees permit. Honestly, I'm not an incumbent. Um, I don't have access to that information, and I don't know. Um, I'd like to highlight one candidate who the city commissioner just mentioned that mediation, he doesn't really like. He doesn't really feel comfortable with it. Well, guess what? When you're an elected official in America, and you're a public servant, every day, it's a 360 approach to every problem. To sit and say, I'm not comfortable with mediation. I'll do it if I have to. I think we all know, if you elect a public servant, they're not going to know all the answers. But what they're going to do is it's this give and take. They're going to say their point of view. They're going to listen to your point of view. There may be a holistic 360 point of view that's totally contradictory and opposing. But that's what makes America be America. We don't want a one lane candidate, a, a one issue candidate just on this issue, and then this, this candidate's on this issue and that issue. We want to elect a five city commission to bring Mr. Wortham's experience, to bring Mr. Irati's Ar experience, uh, Ms. Duncan or Ms. Mr. Bettinger, we want them to all come, their own experiences, their own lifestyles, their own religions, whatever, background. And we want them to come together and work together and say, hey, I may disagree with such and such, but how can we bridge the gap? Where can we agree to disagree? And how can we move the needle forward? You can always go forward by taking different Uh, much like Mr. Wortham, I don't know a specific plan to, to take part-time employees to full-time. What I do know is that our city jobs, number one, have to be competitive. Um, right now, if you work in the city, you probably work for the city or the county. Um, we need to make our jobs competitive to where you don't have to go out work in Beaver Creek, to where you don't have to go out to the suburb to actually make a living. Um, and so, you know, when we're talking about wages and income, we need to figure out how to make city jobs uh, more competitive with the rest of the region because um, it, it's, it's not, frankly, we're talking about jobs that are permanently part-time. Um, how does that put food on the table or you know pay your bills? That's not a real-world proposition for 2023. And so I think a lot of these ideas are just really antiquated and nobody has made it a priority to say, um, you know, a permanent part-time position is not something that puts food on anybody's table. Um, and so how do we fix this? Um, and so if I'm on the city commission, that's certainly a priority for me. I understand what it means to work a regular job. I'm a retail manager now as we speak. Um, I am not a business owner. I am not an engineer. Um, I make an everyday honest guy living, and we need to support that in this city. Um, and that includes our city staff and workforce. Um, so that's how I see it. a contract uh, with the city of Dayton the, the city manager's office gets together with um, representatives from the union and they put together a, a three year contract now because of COVID and because of lack of, uh, of uh, getting revenue to the city of Dayton because people are staying home and uh, working out of their homes so that the city cannot collect when they go out to Beaver Creek or they live in, uh, they go uh, work out in Trotwood, they can't collect that income tax money because they're not going to those particular uh, jobs. Um, the city has always um, dealt with this part-time, permanent, full-time for, for the longest time. Uh, I worked for the city for 31 years contracts are negotiated every three years. Um, there should be a path that that is agreeable with the, the, with the um, AFSCME union and, the, the, and management to get people from part-time permanent to full-time permanent. The reason why they're on part-time permanent is they don't have, they don't get all the benefits as a full-time permanent. And so the city saves money that way. But at the same time, uh, that's to the disadvantage, actually, to, to the city because then you're going to have all these part-time permanents. You know, they only can work up to maybe 30, 35 hours at the most. Uh, and then you're going to actually have more people working.
than if you had a permanent staff. So I would, as a city commissioner, work with the, the AFSCME union to create a pathway for these part-time permits to go to full-time permits. So here's a little surprise for you. The city commission is like a board of directors. They are not the operations people that run the city. That is done by the city manager. That's what a city manager form of government does. We are supposed to provide policy and direction. We are not supposed to get into the nitty gritty of individual hiring. I will tell you there have been stupid things about our hiring process, practices in the city of Dayton for a long time. One of them is that we refuse to recognize police officers with 30 years experience from other departments, especially when they're a black male, and tell them they can't carry a gun because they didn't go through the Dayton Police Academy and keep their notebooks straight. Stuff like this is petty, petty, petty. The reality is, if you work for the city, we're work, we've hired you because we believe in you. And you should have an opportunity to rise up <coughs> through the ranks and become a leader. Now, you want to hear a real horror story in this city? And I know I'm not running for school board, but we have an exceptional Daytonian who has set records in track, who has gone on to get his PhD, has excelled in everything he's done in this city. He's worked in the schools for 20 plus years. And the school board says, no, we're, we're going to rehire the person we never even interviewed and did a background check on. We're not going to open up. They do this sort of thing. Our hiring practices say we don't believe in the people that we have in our operations. This guy's worked in Dayton Public Schools for 30, close to 30 years, and they passed him over for a woman who's been here from six years and has a horrible track record. We've got a problem in Dayton that we don't grow our own. And the real indication of a leader is that they prepared the people underneath them to step up into those jobs when those jobs become available. We don't do a very good job of that here. Uh, so uh, part-time permanents, we probably have the most we've had in a while, about uh, 12 or 15 years ago after the Great Recession. Um, since then, the number of part-time permanents has gone down. Um, and uh, some of the previous speakers here mentioned that the, the number of part time permanents and the path to move up is a, a, a function of the, the agreements that we make with labor. So uh, management sits down with, with our labor unions uh, and negotiates contracts, as Ms. Duncan said. And uh, one of the instructions that we generally give, or we're allowed to give advice, we don't, as Ms. Rice says, we don't get into the weeds of it, but some advice that we give is to reduce the number of part time permanents so people have. Uh, proper pay and proper benefits. So over these years, the number has been reduced and I expect that to continue. Um, and something else that I want to address in a related topic is succession planning. We went, uh, when I was first elected, we had almost 2,000 people employed in our general fund. And as of right now, we're 1,100, 1,150 people. Um, so it becomes really important to make sure that people are trained well, make sure that we're identifying people uh, so they're exposed to different things in the organization so we have the next leaders ready to move up. And that's something that we've emphasized by necessity uh, and because we need good leaders in the city and the city administration. So we're working on that too. And I think that if we're talking about moving part-time permanents to regular positions, uh, that sort of follows through. Uh, we want to be consistent to make sure that we're looking for talented folks ready to move up to leadership too. We need to make that a, a consistent line. Thank you. Great, a big, very good, um, good question. So I agree with, with that, uh, Mr. Um, you know, the way that the market is now, we're, we're in such desperate need for employees that, you know, part-time, and that's a good funnel for us to, to get them into these positions. I will tell you something that uh, we did since I've been on the commission, and that's the Homegrown Heroes Program, where if you work for the organization part-time or whatever, uh, especially with police, you can move to the front of the line in terms of the, um, the police test and to get on the police force. So that was a really good program, and it actually helps with the diversity in the police department because some folks that would have traditionally been left out or um, 
canceled out for whatever reason, uh, are now able to, again, go to the front of the line. So I'm very proud of that work. Um, you know, we, uh, the commissioner was right, the city manager does negotiate contracts, and that's the way it should be. We, we can have some input, and we tell them that we're prioritizing taking care of our people. And that's why uh, Commissioner Joseph and I were both endorsed by the AFSCME Labor Union, as well as most of the other uh, labor unions in this, in this region, uh, because of our commitment to the, to the union, unionized labor and, and our workers uh, in the city. And that's why, frankly, uh, there was a lot of uh, anxiety and anger to a certain degree when we were talking about the budget, because we were committed to supporting our workers who put their skills and lives on the line to do a good job for our citizens each and every day. So we stand up to them, we're gonna to continue to do that, and I just look for your support on November 7th and, and May 2nd. So it's about 7.21. We're gonna to go to a little bit before eight. Uh, and I'll give it back over to the President uh, forward to ask the education or question has with regard to education in our region. Okay, so this is going to be uh, kind of kind of a loaded question, and it's going to you know the NACP has six six major pillars that we deal with, uh, which is economic sustainability, which we've already kind of talked about that a lot here today. Uh, education, public safety and criminal justice, voting rights and political representation, uh, youth and young adult engagement, and health. So those are six major pillars. So we're going, to, so we're going to combine education and youth and young adult engagement together in this next loaded question. And, and then we want to make certain that we get public safety. We started about 15 minutes late, so if you can indulge us to go into about 8.15, that, that, that would really be appreciated. And we're going to go down to one minute answers, too. On, you know, on these questions, after this particular question for, since we're gonna combine education and youth and young adult programs. So, uh, it says, what can be done regarding uh, the DPS school, school system poor academic rep uh, reputation? Uh, so that's part of the question. What can be done regarding DPS poor academic reputation? Uh, combine that with uh, what would you do to support extra fair funding and resources for DPS and youth programs in the community? And cap it off with uh, what happened to the $1 million that the Dayton City Commission passed last fall for youth programs? So that's kind of all combined into one, one package. We'll give you 30, Kenny, we'll give you 30 seconds. Think about it. I got it. Talk to the president real quick. Uh, Mr. Bettinger is on you. So as I mentioned, I have a four-year-old who will be five tomorrow, actually, um, and a three-year-old. Um, I have two sons, and they will be entering DPS schools. I live right behind Roosevelt Elementary. Um, which I've heard is doing pretty well, so we're sending them in. Um, but, you know, just last week, we, our commission was voting on the, the deal to, you know, complete the second phase of the arcade. And past this prologue, the vote came down to, once again, whether they were going to get a 100% tax abatement or a 75% tax abatement before anything is even started. Um, and so what that means is before, I mean, when the deals are signed, our children are having the rug pulled from up underneath them. 60% of every property tax dollar goes to Dayton Public Schools. I mean, and then the rest goes to the libraries, parks, so on and so forth. If we are cutting, you know, all of these deals without, you know, cutting property taxes out of all of these deals, our kids are being shut off right at the start. And so what it becomes about is getting the money back to them, whether it's through the income tax or whether it's through this deal or that deal or whatever. The mechanism is in place to fund our schools. Let's use it. Let's stop saying, oh, you want to build here, Dayton is a great place, oh, but you need a 100% tax abatement to come. What does that mean? Do you really want to be here or do you not? Um, and so when it comes to educating our children, this is a real critical issue. Um, do we want three hotels downtown more than we want an educated student body in Dayton Public Schools? And I think the answer is very clear. 
Um, and so the mechanism is in place. We need to use it. We need to stop trying to cut people out of the deal, make backroom deals with developers and whoever else, um, to, you know, to make sure they come with the red carpet rolled out while our students are struggling for resources. Um, particularly throughout the pandemic, we saw um, what that disparity meant and how it was exacerbated by the lack of resources. Um, so it's time out for saying the only way to come to Dayton is to cheat our children. Well, just to piggyback on, on what uh, Marcus was saying, okay, okay, supporting three hotels in Pasadena. Well, the thing is, uh, why would uh, somebody go to a hotel down in Dayton? I mean, if the convention center is not functioning like it can, it can it should, then you're not going to have that job. You're not going to have the conventioners coming down to Dayton to begin with. The convention center is too small. Mm -hmm. it, uh, the capacity it is, is not up to where it should be. Um, that's why the big conventions, the large conventions, they go to Cleveland, they go to Columbus, they go, they go to Cincinnati, okay? So you, you've got all this tax abatement, and then you have like now three hotels to support. You know, where are the people, where are the people that are gonna be going into those hotels. Now, to get back to the question, um, the CPSU and uh, the City of Dayton uh, Commission can work together, they, they should be working together to help our young people. Uh, what there's a problem is, is um, uh, the, our young people are, are not um, going to school like like we expect them to, you know, and uh, there's also a lack of interest of, in the students. There's, it seems like they have no incentive to actually go to school, you know, show up to school and, and, and do their homework and, and succeed. Uh, so we need, to, we need to change all that. We need to have a comprehensive plan to help our young people. You know, it's funny. I've been talking about this for 30 years and it hasn't gotten a lot better. The school district's gotten a lot smaller. We've seen charter schools. We still haven't addressed the real problems we have with education and day. One is our community is suffering from poverty. It's hard to study when you're hungry. You don't know where you're gonna sleep. You don't know where you're gonna, the next meal's coming from. It's hard when you don't have health care, and there have been all kinds of initiatives left and right, and we're not gonna solve it overnight unless we work to end poverty in this community. That means we don't spend millions of dollars tearing down houses when we in fact need to make sure the houses those kids live in have running water, have sanitation, have a roof over their heads. And for the kids that don't have places to live, we need, and I've said this, there's a video I put out a long time ago called There Ain't No F in Dayton. And you probably should go look at that on YouTube. And it's an entire proposal, including year-round schools, because when you are behind, we can't afford the summer slide. We need to go to year-round schools also because we're not an agrarian society. We don't need the kids out there harvesting in the summertime. Teachers Union says, oh, we work 180 days and then we got to work at night. No, you don't have to work at night. What you need is a school year that's structured where about half the day is in instruction and half the day is in things that get kids interested in school, be it band, music, be it sports, be it computers. We need internet access, high-speed internet access in lots of parts of the city that's affordable and all the kids need to be able to take a computer home. I worked on the Dayton Public Schools Technology Steering Committee. I got outvoted when I said those kids should be given those Chromebooks and they should take them home. Oh, we can't trust them with a Chromebook. Yes, you can. It's called accountability, it's called responsibility. These are life skills that kids need to learn. But the problem at Dayton Public Schools is that we have horrible leadership and a horrible school board that isn't doing its job. And we need three of you to decide to run for the school board this fall, which one of you is gonna do it?
because I can't run for both, okay? And if you haven't been to my blog, Azraeli.com, it's been going since 2005. You can find lots of this information. Thank you. So that's a good question. Uh, what can we do to support DPS, make sure our students have good outcomes and, and succeed like we all want them to do? Um, the, the biggest thing that we've done as a city is uh, we passed issue nine, and every year we give between three and four million dollars to make sure that three and four year olds have quality preschool education. Uh, we help parents pay for it, we help train teachers, we help certify facilities, uh, make sure they know what they need to be a, a two, three, four star facility, um, and the results have, have, have come out and it works. More of our kids are prepared for kindergarten than ever they ever have been before. Um, and I'm very proud that we've taken that step. It's unusual, we were only the second city in the country to do something like that. Um, so I'm really proud that we've done that. Um, I also will say that uh, we need to do a better job of explaining what happens with tax abatements. Um, in these tax abatements that we're talking about, even though money is not there from taxes, uh, we ask the school board to sit down with companies so they either give cash or they pay no, back in other ways. So this minutes. hotel, for instance, they actually will allow a training program for new employees from our schools. No. So the kids will have... No. I'm sorry, Commissioner. That's okay. Let me, give me... You're okay, sure. If you want, okay. Uh, uh, so th this hotel agreed that they would give some cash to the schools and then provide a training program for people to work with hotels and eventually hopefully rise to hotel management. And it's a national chain, international chain. Hopefully we're giving folks opportunities uh, beyond what just cash would provide. So uh, there, there's more than just, just uh, tax money in hand here. There are other things that, that, that companies can provide that uh, we make sure that they sit down and deal with. But uh, I, I think that uh, we do everything with our kids in mind. All of us are, are focused on the future of the city, all of us here, all of my current commissioners. Uh, so we do have that in front of our mind at whatever decisions we make. Commissioner, I'm sorry, thank you. You're okay, thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that, and thanks for the, for the question. I'm not running for the school board, so I really don't have a dog in that fight. Um, but I am on the uh, Turk Council, which is the body that uh, monitors uh, tax incentives. Uh, <clears throat> the county, uh, uh, county auditor chairs it, and members of the school, of every school system affected by a TIF uh, sit at that table. So we're able to see the results of these incentives. Now, I'm a business owner. I, I, don't, I don't like that we are incentivizing development, except where it's leveraged to create other opportunities. And that's exactly what's happening with our tax incentives. Oftentimes, we get 10 times the money that we spent <laughs> on these tax incentives. Now, they are starting to disappear. We're not having to incent projects like we did when I first got elected. Now the market is driving a lot of it. And frankly, that's where we want to be. But there are great benefits to a school system. So what would you rather have, 100% of nothing or 70% of an opportunity uh, into the future, and that's what's happening. And so, I, you know, I'm very proud of the work that we've done in terms of, of tips, but I want to see them decrease and let the market take over uh, and drive it. So, universal pre K, we support our kids in that. It's been nationally recognized uh, uh, as an all American city for that work. <laughs> um, it's really quite remarkable that we led uh, in that way. So, our, our kids were putting a lot of attention on them. Someone mentioned a, a a million dollars in community block grant, grant funding that we set aside for schools, and that was part of that whole budget kind of issue. We were gonna do that anyway, but you don't do that at the budget meeting, and most of that stuff is worked out ahead of time. You go back in February and March and April and make those adjustments, and that's exactly what we're doing, putting a lot of money out there for Rec and Park, because it's very important to us. The mayor held a youth summit. We were very engaged with, with, uh, with our youth. I talked to you about the apprenticeship programs that I set up with the AFL-CIO and the building trades. We're making inroads. Got to get these kids connected to job opportunities, and a lifeguard job at $15 an hour for, Thank you. for a 16-year-old goes a long way. Mr. Worthen? Yes, and I'll repeat, I'm not running for the school board, and I'm not educated. Um, mm -hmm. In my experience, I went to Chamonix Julianne, which is a Catholic high school in the University of Cincinnati. Um, that being said, I think that we can all agree on certain things. Transportation is key. As Ken Nates mentioned transportation. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's hard enough to
to go to a classroom setting and be put in an umbrella. And it's hard to get to school. As a police officer, I dealt with kids. I personally took kids to school because they didn't have transportation. Secondly, a lot of kids are hungry. I mean, they're hungry, they're not being fed. So we're going to school to eat one, one meal a day, and then we're coming home, they're not being fed. So this is a multi-fold question and answer. I don't think any of us have the silver bullet to this problem of uh, the reputation of eight public schools. However, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ryan did make a great point about uh, Mr. Dr. Lawrence. I have, uh, I'm afforded to work out with him. I think he's a fantastic guy. I think the school board is very polarizing. And I think that three of you should run for, uh, for Dayton board because I think that would make a huge difference. Um, I watch the uh, school board meetings and it's clear. It's just conflict of special interest clashing. And um, lastly, mental health. I think with dealing with social media, <coughs> Facebook, the bullying, I think there's something we can invest in with kids in terms of their mental health services. I think we should have more facilities where um, a kid should be able to go to a program and not be labeled by his, by his peers or his classmates. And so there's a lot of things I think can be tried and um, I appreciate that, that, that question. So thank you. Thank you. I'm glad there's a lot of interest in the school board. We'll have a forum on that in September because <laughs> they file in August. And we are deeply, as President Ford and I mentioned our meeting yesterday, we are engaged in conversation right now with the Dayton School Board and the superintendent on our concerns of what's going on in Dayton schools. So uh, keep an eye on that. Several questions dealing with um, law enforcement, speeding, uh, pedestrians feeling safe walking and riding their bikes. And I know Gettysburg has had, a, has had its bumps put in place. I know there are many communities, and President Forward testified in Columbus recently about what they call it with a car. Honing. Honing. And so uh, I, I'd like to just add that to this question. So the question has to do with uh, law, traffic laws, dealing with speedy pedestrians feeling safe to ride their bikes and walk, and, and honing, uh, which is messing up our streets, you know, with this drag racing and everything else. So let's start, uh, Mr. Jesuit Ryan, we haven't started with you yet, so we'll start with you and, and go this way, then, then this way. And this is one minute. Two right? minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes? Two minutes. Okay. No, wait, it's President okay. Price. One minute. One minute. Okay. One minute, team. This doesn't happen in Oakwood. It doesn't happen in Kettering. Why? They have enough police officers on the street who actually write tickets. We stopped writing tickets a long time ago, except with a photo enforced camera. People get to know these things and they go and do what they want. You see a lot of filters over license plates. You see all kinds of ways to get around this. Putting bumps and humps out in the streets is a really pathetic fix. It makes it really hard to plow the streets in the winter. It's not a good solution. This city hasn't gotten any smaller geographically, but our police department's gone from 500 to 330. There's a reason we're having these problems, and it's not something you're gonna solve unless you start writing tickets, you start making the expectations that people are abiding by traffic laws, and then things start to change. It's that simple. It doesn't happen in Kettering, it doesn't happen in Oakwood. Thank you. Mr. Jelson? Yeah, this is a tough problem. Uh, we've seen uh, we've seen highs and lows. It's gotten worse, it's gotten better, it's gotten worse. Um, one thing that we can do, in the that we know we can do, is design to make things safer for pedestrians, design to make it, to encourage people not to speed. Uh, you see on West 3rd Street, the road narrowing that happened a couple years ago, um, it slowed down traffic. Um, now we have a foot track there, um, and other, other streets in the city have done the same thing. In fact, uh, our Wayne Avenue Business Association folks are asking to have Wayne Avenue, they call it putting on a road diet, to shrink the road, uh, to slow down traffic, make it safer for pedestrians and folks on bikes. So while there has to be enforcement, um, and there are options to maybe use technology better in those ways, I think the design of the roads and how we, how we set things up has just as much to do with that. So I'd encourage more of that. Yes. So it's funny, I got asked that question today at a Salem Avenue Business Association meeting uh, earlier this afternoon. And uh, you know, my response was, no, we, we take 
the steps that we can. So speed bumps, that's not the solution, but it's a bridge to the solution where we can attract uh, money. Again, uh, doing the work with my infrastructure committee, we're bringing back money here to do just that, street calming, uh, trying to make the streets safer. Um, but it's a long-term fix. Road diets, they help putting in roundabouts and things like that, very expensive. But we're looking at ways that we can get some of those things funded. Uh, I'll disagree with you. There is going to be everything. Upwood, tearing, everything. And across this country, it's happening uh, also. So we got to push back on it because it's very dangerous and very costly. It is tearing up the streets. Um, and we're working to do everything we can do. We're being re very responsive to the neighbors because they call us and they say, I want a speed bump. And before someone gets killed, I want you to put a speed bump here. Even if you can't do the total solve, start there. So that's what we're doing. <clears throat> yes, thank you for that question. I'm the only former Dayton police officer here in this whole room. What you heard is not me. Okay, I can go into great detail. Back in the 60s and 70s, you had rapport with the citizens. They knew the officers that worked at beat. You know why? Because that, that officer was the next door neighbor. They had skin in the game. You talk to a Dayton police officer now, they'll say, they're not going to back us. They don't understand. They focus on all the wrong crap that they use more artful language. So if you don't have trust and you don't have love between the police and the citizens, you can waste your time talking about speed bumps, speed tickets, no license, da 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 da. I mean, we can just sit here and go down and pit at all these. That's not the real issue. The real issue is community relations. The people got to trust the police. The, the people have the power. The police don't have the power. If I'm a citizen, I'm giving you that power. If I don't trust you, I'm going to take that power away. So you're not going to stop me. And you're not going to give me a ticket. Because we as a community run this community. And we're not running it the right way. Mr. 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 Thank you. <coughs> well, no, I can piggyback off of what Mr. Worthen said. Um, yeah, there is no transparency. There's no conversation. There's no relationship between our community and our police. I recently spoke at a commission meeting where they were trying to expand police capabilities to tap into cameras downtown. Um, but they were doing it without exploring the impact on the community um, without, and without being transparent about how they intended to use it. Um, and so when you are talking about a relationship between authority and the community that they are charged to serve, there needs to be transparency and there needs to be honesty. And we don't get that from our police. So it is no surprise to me that people flagrantly break the law in our community. There's no respect there to Jordan Wortham's point. Um, what we need is a police department that is far more intentional about speaking to the community they represent um, and hearing their concerns and representing that in a real way and not this top-down approach that says if you give us more money and more resources, we will police the hell out of you. Um, that doesn't work. We've seen it. Uh, we still have a problem with honing, um, despite you know going and trying to increase penalties at the state level. They don't care. What we need is a, a relationship where they actually respect authority. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Mr. President, do you have an next one? Oh, did we start? We start. Oh, we start. Yeah. Oh, oh, I know what we start. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. So this next question is: uh, So, so we've talked about economic sustainability, education, youth and young adult engagement. 
uh, public safety and criminal justice. So uh, we got one more question for public and safety, public safety and criminal justice. We're going to end with voting rights and political representation uh, with uh, Senator Roberts. Uh, we're going to, if we come up with something for help, it's going to be about 30 seconds. Uh, but this next question is, we have lost a lot of police officers due to the amount of uh, due to pay. Is there discussion to raise officers' pay uh, at City Hall? <coughs> is there, bottom line, is there discussion to raise officers' pay? So, so who's this guy? This guy. Oh, oh, you just started with me last time. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. It's a good question. Uh, simple answer is yes. Yeah, there's talks. Uh, this year is the opening negotiation for Stone Convention. That's how things get done with our labor unions. Uh, the administration talks to the labor unions. They come to a deal with inflation, with the fact that we need to make sure we're retaining officers. There's absolutely conversations about raising pay. So we'll see later this year. Yes, that's right. We are having conversations about it. About that, and, and that's part of the labor negotiations with the uh, with the FOP. So I'll let Senator Manager deal with that. I am very proud of the work that we did with police reform. When we met for 18 months uh, with about 100 community members and police uh, to engage and to try to figure out how we can make things better between the community and the police. We received national recognition for that as well. Uh, so I am I'm very proud of that work, and we should continue it. It's not perfect. It's what it meant to be perfect from the start. Is that we keep tweaking it and making it better as we go along. And we're gonna to continue to do that work. Our police are leaving and it is uh, uh, largely due to pay because uh, our training is so good that other police departments, you know, they, they suck those guys up and they want them to come out there because they're so highly, so very highly trained. And we have to just make opportunities. And I think if we continue to engage with the police department, let them know that they are respected, that they, we care about them, that I think that will have an effect on uh, on making Thank them want to stick around. Mr. Local. Worther, thank you. Okay, the city commissioners are completely wrong. You talk to a day police officer making about $38 an hour. That's pretty good pay. And if I'm a police officer, I'm not policing for profit. I'm not policing just because I want to make a bunch of money. We make more money than Senator Police Department. We make more money than uh, Harrison. We make more money. Day Police Department is one of the top paying jobs in the state of Ohio. Good insurance. What we care about as officers is being treated with respect being appreciated by the community, being appreciated by our command staff and our commissioners. If you don't want to show appreciation for me, bye. I can go work somewhere else. I can go work with Kevin and be called Ohio Spikes. And Dayton, look at my city commissioners, look at my mayor, dog and pony. They talk nice. They got the nice suits. The mayor got the nice suits. Who would it say? No. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, um, I, I just think, you know, yes, we should be paying people a livable wage, but I think the, the more holistic conversation we should be having is away from police and to firefighters, because as I canvass and talk to firefighters, they are underpaid and they are leaving Dayton. Um, understaffed, we have an entire fire station closed with houses burning down, with unhoused people in them, seniors in them. That is an issue. So as long as we continue to talk about police, we are going to ignore the fuller conversation about public safety and that we don't deserve to be burning up in our homes either. Um, so let's have a real conversation about public safety and pay the people who keep us safe in our homes, not the ones who keep us safe on the street. And that's our firefighters. Thank you. Okay, Doctor, there's a lot of all sorts of issues in, in this one thing. Okay, it, yes, the contracts with the police department are negotiated with the FOP. Um, can we increase the, the wages? That should be negotiated uh, to, the, uh, to the city manager's office. Uh, we have a good uh, police academy. See, like Mr. Shaw said, we train our police, train them to be police, and then they go off to some other place, you know, Kettering, Oakwood, uh, Harrison Township, or whatever. So we need to give the incentive of those uh, uh, cadets to stay here in Dayton, and then, um, and then they'll they'll be 
we'll have more police officers because right now they, they are leaving to other places. I'm going to say some things that the police union is not going to like. Number one, if that police academy can't be run year round as a for profit center training police officers for people in the entire region, we can shut it down and we can just have our police go to somewhere else. Now, if you say we need specialized training and for you know the departments, we need to open it up everywhere and it should make us money. Number two, Lateral transfers. We're just hiring our first people that have qualified in other departments. This is long overdue. But I want to tell you about what I have a real problem with. There are institutions in this community that don't pay taxes. And yet they can afford to have their own private police forces. Do you remember Samuel DeBose who got shot by a University of Cincinnati police officer? He didn't report to anybody in government. He reported to a college president. We have the same thing at UD. We have the same thing at Sinclair. We have Metro Parks. We have Miami Valley Hospital and Kettering Hospital. They all have their own police departments. I'm sorry. Where do rich people get to have their own police departments with no oversight by the public? We need to have them pay for those officers, and they should be Dayton officers, and we should increase the size of our department. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know that. Most of the city commission really has little or nothing to do with voting rights or voter suppression and redistricting. But often the city commissioners and the mayors across the state show up in the capital and show up in Washington and express the citizens' views on redistricting, reapportionment, uh, and as we are debating right now, joint resolutions to lower the, uh, the vote uh, from 50 plus one to 60 percent on citizens initiative. So the question would be, and this is a one minute question, right? The, the one minute question starting this, Mr. Benninger, come this way is, where would you stand on those issues and how would you represent the interests of the people of the city of Dayton, <coughs> Washington, or in Columbus on those kinds of issues, okay? It's an open-ended question of voter suppression and voters' rights. Yes, so I think um, if we're talking about the federal level, I'm certainly advocating for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. I think that um, is a, a huge step in the right direction. But what we can do practically, so when I was in college, and this is where I really got my start in terms of being engaged in politics, I was the guy walking around with voter registration forms. You did not find me um, without my back, back passport with voter registration forms. And we made a plan to pick it up, to mail it off, or go turn it in. We made a plan to early vote or vote on primary day, election day, whatever the case may be. Um, it's time out for our commission and our mayor showing up to events, wanting to dance and grab free food and not registering voters. Um, that's what we can do right here, practically on the ground, is register people who can be registered and make sure they are engaged before we go to the federal level and fight you know, our Senate, which is the home of inaction um, for federal legislation. So be about what you talk about. If you want people to vote for you, grow the electoral base. Um, make that real and what you do every day. And so that's how I would change that. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> that's a more fantastic question too. Um, yeah, we all need to get involved. I mean, when I went around with my petition, I, if people weren't registered to vote, I had a registration form and I got it into the Board of uh, Elections. Um, as a city commission, we need to encourage people to register to vote. And it starts at our schools, our elementary schools and our high schools. We need to bring back teaching kids about our Constitution, our civil rights, the, the right to vote. I mean, this goes all the way back to the, uh, the Civil War. After the Civil War, uh, Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass concentrated on two amendments to end slavery, to become a citizen, and the right of uh, African American man to vote. And it, that, that's where it started. But we, we have to progress it. We can't let it go stalemate. So we have to educate our, our young people again on their right to vote. Thank you. I have two nonprofits. I have a 501c3 and a 501c4. The 501c4 is talking about creating UNIGOV in this region. It's called Reconstructing Dayton, reconstructingdayton.org. And there's one called the Modern Policy Institute. 
Twitter, <coughs> modernpolicy.org, where we're looking at ways to make voting mean things again. That means things like actually having real-time donor registration. You hear about voter registration. How about donors have to register and show where the money comes from? So you can find out who paid for Commissioner Shaw and who paid for Commissioner Joseph when they go to vote on something. We need to restructure the entire process. And one of the things I think we really need is to take the power away from the two-party system because in Ohio, there are more people who are not a member of either party. Now, that doesn't matter in this election. It's a nonpartisan election. But if we bring in ranked choice voting, where you say, this is my first choice, my second choice, my third choice, we could skip this whole primary process, and we could skip a lot of wasted money on a primary, and we could actually lead the nation with a progressive system that works. Do you remember when there were like 14 Democratic candidates running, and by the time they got here, all we could vote for was Joe Biden? This is not a democracy. Ranked choice voting, one election, these are the things I want to advocate for. Thank you. Thanks, Senator, for that very good question. Uh, it is shameful what our state legislature is trying to do right now to make it harder for citizens to have their voices heard and to do it on something which uh, just last year they, said they decided they weren't going to have any more August votes. And now they decided in this circumstance because they want to, they want to make sure that their uh, things that they're afraid of don't get passed. And now they're changing the rules. It's, it's terrible behavior. It's anti-democratic. And I'm 100% against the change that they're talking about. Um, you're right, at the local level, there's not a whole lot that we can do directly, but we can, as I do, carry voter registration forms. We can advocate at the state and federal level for the changes that need to happen. Um, things that, that other states have done, have been successful doing, are when you register your car, you register to vote. Uh, they've expanded drop-off locations instead of restricted them for ballots. Uh, they have uh, made sure that it's, it's easier to register instead of harder. We've seen in our history too many times when the vote was restricted, and everybody knows why, right? It's for money and for power, and we need to fight against this latest wave. We will beat it. It's going to take a while, but we'll beat it. But it, it is, uh, it's discouraging to live in times when they're still trying to do this. So uh, I encourage everyone to fight at all Thank levels you. against this. Mr. Thank Shaw. you. Yeah, I carry voter registration cards with me when I'm out walking and uh, constantly talk to folks about the importance of voting. Uh, it, it's everything. But what I also do, I support my local NAACP because they are doing the work uh, in this community and communities across our country. And thank you, Tom, what you're doing with the state. Yeah. Very important. So if you support the NAACP, <laughs> you, uh, you are supporting voter registration and we will make things a lot better. in the city of Dayton, they want to hold their seat. I'm going to ask you a question. Can you think of an incumbent that has lost their seat in the city of Dayton without it being drama injected in terms of a criminal case, um, somebody looking for opportunity to move up? Anytime there's an incumbent in that seat, they want low voter turnout. You know why? Because every day they're buying votes. They're doing friends. They're doing uh, favors for friends and family. Hey, I, I, I showed up for you. I need you, to, I need you to show up for me. So the six, seven percent that's going to vote here uh, Tuesday, about 6,000 people, they like it. It helps them. I want 70 percent of people to vote. I want people to have more options. They want less. It increases their odds of keeping that position. He's, they've been here for 20, 30 years, and they don't want to lose the Thank money and power. Mr. President. OK. Um, so you all have had an opportunity to hear five of our six pillars that each one of these candidates has had an opportunity to speak on. <coughs> economic sustainability, education, youth and young adult empower, uh, youth and young adult empowerment, public safety and criminal justice, voting rights and political representation. So we have one more, uh, which is health. Do we have any health, do we have any health care professionals inside the room today? So the question is, and this is a 30 second question, we need a solid yes or no answer, and then with, your, uh, with the remaining solid yes or no, your, your, the rest of your 29 or 28 seconds, tell us what you're gonna do about it. Mental health is huge, and it's, a, and it's problematic uh, throughout our community. As you've seen, 
there was two ladies uh, who put together on a mental who put together a mental health forum, black men's mental health forum, here uh, about a couple of weeks ago, and uh, you know one her father uh, was a mur committed this murder suicide. He's young, and another lady she was a victim of domestic violence. So the question is, do you believe that there is a mental health issue in Dayton, Ohio, with some citizens, and what are you going to do about it? Mm. Right here. So there's absolutely a mental health crisis in Dayton and many other communities. Um, first, what we need to do, to Mr. S. Wright's point, is address poverty. When you are hungry, when your home is dilapidated, or you don't have one, um, when your schools are substandard, you have mental health problems. It was just on the news the other day. Working conditions, poor working conditions, create poor mental health. Um, that is Dayton across the board. And so we need to be serious about acknowledging the problem. We need to remove the stigma of mental health and then create access to the resources that are in place and then expand those resources. Thank you very much. Okay, well, all the stresses in, in our society, I think everybody probably has some degree of, of mental, mental health problems. Um, yes, our homeless, they say that 80% of the people that are homeless was because they had so many medical bills, so many bills, that they lost their house, they lost their car, and now they're out on the street. So we have to do, we do have to address the economic issues in order to get to the mental health issues. But it starts in the schools again. It starts in the schools. We, we have to address it in the schools and then Thank you. work up. Yes, we have a mental health problem. We also have one in Congress and in this country in general that we don't believe government can provide good health care. We need universal health care. Everybody, period. Best way to create jobs is have health care. Trust me, I own a small business. For the last seven and a half years, I've been honored to be the power of attorney, fiduciary, and caregiver to a 100% disabled, mentally disabled veteran. I'm now also the POA for his mentally ill brother, who's been in jail for over a year and a half without ever seeing a courtroom and being found guilty. There are a lot of problems, there are solutions, but this country is not prepared for it yet. I hope to move that agenda forward. Mr. Joseph? Uh, yes, mental health is a problem, it's increasing due to pandemic and due to a lot of factors that have been talked about by my colleagues here. Uh, what we're doing about it, uh, one thing is we just got federal money to put together a mental health response unit so that uh, people that respond to scenes uh, will have the training and will have the resources necessary to care for the folks with mental illness and to treat mental illness as an illness and not a crime. And I'm very proud of that. We need to do more of that. Yes, there absolutely is a mental health crisis in this country, um, and of course, right here in Dayton. Um, uh, the mayor had a youth summit. There were four or five different uh, breakout sessions that students could go attend. The line for mental health services was wrapped around the, the block. So uh, yes, we have a, a critical need there. My uh, police engagement committee came up with the uh, mediation response unit, and I'm very proud of that because it's important. I'd say two pronged answer to this is the people at the top, they need to stop representing themselves like the perfect. I think every person in this room suffers from mental health to some degree. I have my own personal issues, and guess what? Unlike traditionalists, I'm proud of my issues. I have anxiety, PT, I have all that. But I'm a man, I'm, I, every day is a battle. Medicaid should be expanded, that helps resources. People should not have to pay two, three hundred dollars to go, go talk to a doctor for 30 minutes. There's a lot of things, but I, it starts at the top. I mean, we need to stop electing politicians who pretend to be perfect and act like Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Thank you, candidates. Uh, I, I failed to say a thing about uh, we are part of the Montgomery County GL Coalition, and one of the issues is mental health, reducing the population in the county jail. We've been to the city hall. We've been to the county commissioners. So if you are elected and reelected, we're, we can count on the Montgomery County Jail Coalition coming to you to say, we don't need a big jail. We need a jail that meets the mental health and alcohol needs of our, of our inmates and our people in the county jail. So I, I meant to, should put that on the table because my colleagues would be upset with me if I didn't say that because we meet weekly to discuss this issue. I'm gonna start uh, on the end again. 
and give you 30 seconds to give us your yourselves pitch on why you should be elected or re-elected to the Dade City Commission. So let's begin 30 seconds. Thank you again for the opportunity. I would just say that I am a fresh face, a new vision. Um, a lot of these people have been here for years and years and years and years. Um, and we need some new ideas for Dayton. I, like I said, when I walk out of my house, I see what a lot of Daytonians see, the abandoned homes, the neglect. Um, it's important to me, and it will always be a priority. When my, my kids are young, they're going to DPS. It's important to me, it will always be a priority. These are not things that I'm doing for favors, they're not things that I'm doing to be seen. A lot, most people in Dayton don't even know who I am. I'm here because I care. Thank you. So I, I have 31 years of experience. I hope to bring that to, to help the citizens of Dayton, and um, I hope I have your vote. I've been doing this a long time, and obviously I should stop, right? No, I'm not going to stop. Why am I not going to stop? Because it shouldn't be as easy as it is for me to find stories to write about indignities in our city that are caused by our government. I want you to go to Zerati.com forward slash deadly to look at how our sheriff treated people in jail where they were pepper spraying people in restraints. And he said it wasn't a, de a big deal. He's now promoted to the state house. We have a problem. I don't want any citizen to ever be treated like that. I don't want them to be drug out of their cars by their hair when they're a paraplegic. I believe it's time to bring respect back to the people. Thank you. Mr. Joseph. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Senator. Uh, I've been proud to be your city commissioner. I ask you to reelect me again. I enjoy what I do. I enjoy listening to you. I enjoy uh, trying to make things better for the city, for us, and for our kids. I love the fact that we're going to be demolishing uh, crappy houses and all kinds of neighborhoods coming up. We're supporting entrepreneurs and new businesses. Uh, we're, we're, we're have a, there's a lot underway right now that I want to see through. There's a lot started. Things are slowly getting better after tough times. We're going to go through fits and starts. Uh, you've seen a lot of that tonight, sort of aired out, but we're going to get there. Things are getting better, and I really want to be part of these, these new solutions as they come through. Thank you, and I appreciate your vote. Yes, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to ask you for your vote on next Tuesday and in November. I want to continue the good work that I've been doing over these past several, almost eight years now. Uh, a lot of good things have happened. I want to be here uh, for when the benefits uh, come out of it. One thing I learned uh, by being on this commission, it takes time to do uh, the development and make the changes, but we're starting to see it happen. It's not all gloom and doom. There are some really good positive messages and positive stories out there and good opportunities that uh, we're going to take advantage of. So I'm asking you for your vote. Thank you. Well, you should vote for me because you want change. I'm a former Dayton police officer, business person. I deeply care about it. These guys here, these commissioners, they have everything to lose. I have nothing. You don't vote for me and my day continues. I'm still gonna be a social justice warrior. I'm still gonna have my investments. I'm still gonna have my son. The city commissioners and the mayor, they come, they're tense, they're scared. They don't wanna lose this. If they lose this, it's an embarrassment. So I enjoy it, like Mr. Zerati, make them nervous. Because I'm gonna get in and I'm gonna fight for what's right. Not fight to get a second term, third term, fifth term, sixth term, seventh term. Let's move on. Give the torch to the other guy. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, as you have heard, there is a clear difference in many of your candidates. And this is why we thought that it was very important to bring this candidate forum to the city tonight. Because one week from today, you're going to be making some very tough decisions. It's going to be a field, of, we're now in a field of six, it's going to be reduced to a field of four next Tuesday. After that field of four on Tuesday, now you're going to have an opportunity to hear their stump speeches from May until November. And four will, and those are the four individuals, you're going to have an opportunity to pick the top two individuals that will continue to lead Dayton forward. So you have an opportunity to hear differences. 
It's going to be up to you to talk to your constituents, to talk to your family, to talk to your friends, the people who are not here tonight. And, I, and my hope is that we do not have a low voter turnout like we have a low voter participation here inside this room today. That's really the scary thing about midterm elections is low voter turnout. People should understand that voting is critical to our democracy and voting is critical to any and everything that you want to do in your life and how you want to carry the ball down the field with your children and your loved ones. So you're, you have some choices to make. And I, and I do want to say that we do have, the mayor is here, Mayor Jeffrey J. Mills is in the house today. And I'll yield to you to give you uh, maybe just one minute, one minute, one minute uh, to speak to us about why it's important to vote. Four reasons. No endorsements. No endorsements. Four reasons you should vote. Vote for things that benefit you, your livelihood, your family, and your community. Uh, for the last 12 years, I've been registering 18-year-olds to go vote for the first time in their lives. And again, most of them bring their parents with them as well to go vote and they uh, sometimes bring cousins as well. But the, the aspect of voting is very critical to what we do as far as our nation's concerned. The issues in terms of how we make sure that government is served for the masses of people, not just for a few. You hear that a lot. When you look at the kinds of things that happen across the nation, you see people who are misusing those processes very well. You see a lot of people talking about things that have absolutely nothing to do with the quality of life of people. <laughs> he was on time. <laughs> he stopped before you put it up. Yep. <laughs> all right, so, so, uh, so first of all, uh, I want to say thank you, Mr. Bettinger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for you. participating in our Canvas Forum this evening. And I want to turn it over to uh, our chairman of our political action committee, and then he closes out, and he has uh, a few things, some wrap-ups, and he closes out. Uh, again, um, I've always said there's nothing such as off-year voting. For those school board members, for the city commission, voting is important. Township trustees, our next forum, we meet as a general membership the fourth Monday of every month. Our next political forum will be the fourth Monday in September. We'll have the candidates who have come beyond the primary. We'll have township trustees. We'll have school board members. So it'll be a big turnout. And I'm not sure where it's going to be, but mark your calendars for our next political forum, which will be the fourth Monday in September. Of course, county commissions, I think Dayton, Trotwood, mayors, and, and um, school board candidates will be, on, will be in that forum. So I thank my team. I always want to thank my team. Sometimes I have to help them out, but that's okay. <laughs> but I think it's important for you to know we respect your time, and we're going to do it in a proper way. And they understand it, you understand it, and when you come to our candidates forum, it's not going to be any, any name calling, any, any, any an insult. It's going to be a good education forum. So I thank you, the team, for your assistance again. I thank all the candidates, and I'll see the best team in September. Thank you, Mr. President. So with that, <coughs> may God bless you, may God bless the NACP, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's coming up.